Uh, let's jump in. So two weeks ago was Pentecost Sunday, and I brought somewhat of a standalone message on the subject of the Holy Spirit. But the content of uh, that, that subject is so deep and so wide that it just couldn't all be addressed. And so I'm going to do a continuation from that message today. Uh, last week, Pastor David brought a message encouraging us to serve. He invited us to imagine what it would have been like to have been there when Jesus performed all of those miracles that we read about in the Bible. And he talked about how the disciples were there. They were a part of those miracles because they chose to serve. Right? They chose to leave everything behind and to follow Jesus, which ironically is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. The Holy Spirit empowers us to serve. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be a witness more specifically. I love what the Bishop, Bishop Tim Hill of the Church of God says, that the baptism in the Holy Spirit isn't for our enjoyment, but for our employment. Yeah. Now, too many people want the benefits without putting in the work. I see a lot of people and a lot of Christians criticizing our current work ethic in America. But if we're brutally honest with ourselves, we often treat the Holy Spirit the same way. I want the power and I want the miracles and I want the peace and I want all of the things that make me feel good. But I'm not interested in the parts of the Holy Spirit that I can't understand. I'm not interested in the parts of the Holy Spirit that force me to take a hard look at myself and change some things on the inside. Instead of pursuing a relationship with the Holy Spirit, we treat him more like friends with benefits. That was a lot of heat for the first page, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, so a couple of weeks ago, we ended talking about this passage of Scripture found in the book of Luke, chapter 11. It says, beginning in verse 9, Jesus is talking. He says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everybody say, Everyone. The one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, the door will be open. Listen to the language that it uses. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks on the door, it will be opened. Then he says in verse 11, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Let's pause here just for a second. There is a camp that would say that the manifestations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are of the devil. Some of you were brought up that way. Some of you have heard that. They would say that it's demonic and that you should stay away from it at all costs. But I want us to go back to Luke chapter 10 before we keep reading. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus is talking. He says, I've given you authority to trample. Look at the language on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. All right, now back to Luke 11, 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a uh, fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Do you see the language? Right? Scorpions and snakes are referred to, right? Jesus refers to those when he's talking about demonic activity. But then in this other passage, when he's saying, look, if you're going to ask for the Holy Spirit, God's not going to give you a demon. Amen. He's already given you authority over that. The language isn't co coincidental. Verse 13 says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Look, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit is no different than receiving our healing or our salvation or any other gift or blessing that God has available for us. We receive it all by grace through faith. We have to come back to a place of trusting that God's word is true, that God's word will work if we apply it to our lives, that if we begin to meditate on it and speak it and pray it and think about it and declare it with our mouth, that we will see God's promises come to pass in our lives. What did Jesus say in Mark eleven twenty four? 24? Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Look, we wish that it said receive it first and then you can believe it. But instead it says believe what you have, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Or we get so worked, over the, up, worked up over this in the spiritual world. Oh, I can't say I'm healed if I'm not healed. Or I can't say I'm blessed if I'm struggling to pay my bills. But we do this all the time in our everyday lives. I mean, how many of you have ever mailed a check to someone knowing that there wasn't enough money in the account on the day that you mailed it in because you knew that direct deposit was going to hit before they received it? Has anybody ever done that? Right? You knew that the money would be in the bank before the check arrived at its destination. 
Right? You might send a check on Wednesday with no money in your account, but you know that on Friday a direct deposit is going to hit and everything's going to be just fine. Right? That's what it's like to exercise faith. Every time we speak the word of God over our situation, every time that we declare, I am forgiven, I am healed, I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I am blessed, I am victorious, I am the head and not the tail. Those words are like writing spiritual checks, knowing that God is about to make a deposit into your spiritual account. And at the right moment, your words that are full of faith will meet God's provision and you will have what God has promised. We have to begin to exercise our faith, believing that we have the things that we don't yet see. I'm not talking about turning God into a genie in the bottle. We don't rub the uh, the Bible, out pops the Holy Spirit, and gives us three wishes. I'm talking about declaring what God has already said. I'm talking about believing that God will do what He said He will do. I'm talking about believing that I have received before I see it, knowing that God will come through. It's time to begin to act as if you already know that your spiritual direct deposit is coming. All right, going back to a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I, said, I said the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not the salvation experience. That, that, the, let me read it again. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not salvation. It's, diff- it's a different experience subsequent to salvation. And I wanted to unpack that a little bit more and give you some more verses to come alongside of this and, and, and support that. If you remember, we spent a little time discussing how John was baptizing with water unto repentance. But Jesus but said that Jesus would later come and baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus is the baptizer. of the, uh, he, He's the one that baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. We read that in all four Gospels. I won't read it all again. But in Matthew 3, verse 11, I'll read one, one version. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now you can find the parallels of that in Mark chapter 8, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, and John chapter 133. And I would encourage you to to read that. Now fast forward from there to the book of Acts. And here we have the exact same words, but now instead of John saying them, Jesus is saying them. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John baptized with water... But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now let's jump again to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We read this a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, very popular passage of Scripture. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now notice that tongues and being baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit go together. Tongues isn't the only sign, but it is a sign. It's considered the initial evidence. Some would say if you haven't spoken in tongues that you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I completely agree with that in its entirety. I know too many people who speak in tongues but act like the devil everywhere but church. Some of them act like the devil at church too. (laughs) On the flip side, I know many people who are obviously filled with the Spirit of God who would say, I've never spoken in tongues. So I feel tension in the middle because of how our covering believes, how I've been taught. Um, I feel tension. And I don't 100% know where I land on this particular issue on a personal level. Just like we spoke about with healing, there are just so many nuances to this that I think it's hard to make blanket statements that just cover everybody. What I can say is this, that nearly every time we see people getting baptized with the Holy Spirit in in the New Testament, we also see them speaking in tongues. We also read in... uh, In Corinthians, where Paul says, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. Now hear me. No matter where you are on this journey, never allow yourself to get caught up in condemnation. Because Satan will whisper in your ear, oh, you didn't receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's something wrong with you. Oh, you'll never be good enough. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. That that Satan is the accuser of the brothers. 
Right? Don't listen to the lies of Satan. There's nothing wrong with you just because you've sought the Holy Spirit and you haven't spoken in tongues or operated in some other spiritual gift that's listed in the Scripture. Look, there's no varsity and JV team here. Right? There's just one team united in our pursuit of more of Him. Amen. All right, back to Acts. The Holy Spirit has now been poured out. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what I want to focus on here is the concept that salvation and the Spirit and filling or baptism are distinctly different. All right, in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven and he raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Right, the baptism of the Holy Spirit has fallen. They've all begun to speak in other languages. People from all over, uh, every nation have come. And they're like, we, we don't understand this. These people are from Galilee, but they're speaking our dialect. They're speaking our native language. How can we hear them declaring the works of God? So Peter stands up and he says, he raises his voice to address the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And we're going to read what he said a little bit later. Peter then continues to preach. And then in verse 37, they respond to his message. All right, so we're going to skip a bunch of verses. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38. And Peter replied, Repent. That's salvation. And be baptized, that's water, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's spirit baptism. We see three baptisms in this one verse, right? A few weeks ago, I don't have time to go out all back and read all that, but in Corinthians, Paul said that we are baptized into one body. That's when we become saved. We are baptized into the body of Christ. That's salvation. That's the first baptism. The other baptism, which is easy to understand, water baptism. And then the third, which most people, a lot of people don't know that there is a third one, is the Holy Spirit. But we see all three of those in verse 38. Then watch what Peter says in verse 39. The promise is for you and all your children and for all who are far off and for whom the Lord our God will call. How many of you are one of those that was far off? I'm glad that Peter said, it's not just for you, it's for everybody. Look, and we know that he's talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit because this is the same language that Jesus used when he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised. Right? Look at the language that Peter used. He called it a gift, and then he says, the promise is for you. What's the promise? The Holy Spirit. And look, 24 49, Jesus again, he says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. What's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the promise. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a gift. But here's the good news. It wasn't just for them. Peter said it's for everyone, which means this gift, this promise is still available to us today. Amen. I want to give you a few more passages to look at that clearly point to the fact that baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate experience than the salvation experience. All right, Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. And it said, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. There's a lot happening in this passage of Scripture. I encourage you to read the whole thing this week. It's, it's an amazing passage of Scripture. But for the sake of time, we're going to skip down to verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem, and the language, so pay real close attention. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You see that. You see, this is two separate things that are happening. They accepted the word of God. They became new believers. And then they were baptized in or they received the Holy Spirit. They, they become believers, but they had not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, some people believe that when you are saved, the first baptism, that the Holy Spirit fills you then. It, he does. He does fill you then. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you at that moment. But it's a different experience 
then what happens? The Holy Spirit came into their lives when they accepted the word of God. They became new believers, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19. Let me jump over a little bit. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. Who did he find? Disciples. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? See, these people are already believers. And they answered, no, we have not yet. Uh, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he told them to believe, he told them to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Again, the same situation. These people were believers. Paul called them disciples. But listen to the words of Paul again in verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Right? These people were believers, but they had not received what we call the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. It's also important to understand the timeline that's happened here because we read the book of Acts and we can just read it and read it and it feels like this continuous thing, like it just happened over a couple of weeks. We're talking years have expired here. Acts chapter 19 is 24 or 25 years after the day of Pentecost. It's 20 years after Paul had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Why is this important? Because receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit was of utmost importance to the early church. We treat the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a secondary issue. But Paul and the disciples treated it as a primary issue. They couldn't have done all that they did. They couldn't have turned the world upside down. We wouldn't be here today had they not operated in and had the power and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So what about us? What about you? Have you received all three baptisms? meaning baptized into the body of Christ, salvation, water baptism, and spirit baptism? Or are you like the believers in Acts 19? You didn't know that there was another experience subsequent to salvation. You didn't know that there was a difference in surrendering your life to Christ and becoming baptized in the Holy Spirit. Have we stopped short of what God has for us? I don't know about you, but I want all that he has Amen. for me. I want all that he has. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a gift. Max, you can come play. If Jesus has a gift for me, I would like to have it. We read these two passages of Scripture a few months ago, but I want to look at them again. And you can come to the drums, too. Um, we're going to sing another song or two in just a minute. I'm just kind of waiting on the Lord. Nobody has to get scared. I've got to go. <laughs> well, I don't know. He's about to get the snakes out. They're probably underneath that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how some people feel about the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, some of you, before you came here, that you, you thought that you had an imbalanced view and a misunderstanding of who the Holy Spirit is. It's not an it. It's a person to have a relationship with. You know, I've told some of these stories before, but I mean, I grew up in eastern Kentucky. And in, in my town, when I grew up, people handled snakes. And sadly, that gets associated with Pentecost. You say Pentecostal, and people think rattlesnakes and copperheads and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's just not... This is not who God is. The gift of the Holy Spirit is certainly not something to be afraid of. If Jesus called it a gift, again, I, I want whatever gift he's given. We joked about this a couple of weeks ago. Some of us get gifts and we re-gift them. We're like, oh, no thanks. But not when Jesus gives you one. Look, no one can deny we're living in a crazy time. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives to be all that God has called us to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's writing a letter to Timothy, and he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. 
People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Sounds like our culture today, doesn't it? I mean, it certainly appears that we're in the last days. Look, everybody's mad that we've kicked God out of America, but the reality is in a lot of places we've kicked God out of the church. Everyone want to pray that God will change America, but the truth is, is we need to pray that God will change the church. Look, America isn't the bride of Christ. The church is. Jesus isn't coming back for a spotless nation. He's coming back for a spotless church. So Paul says, look, in the last days, there are going to be terrible times. People are going to do all these things. But let's go back to the sermon that Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. When he's quoting the book of Joel. And he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your men, young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those last days. And they will prophesy. Listen, we're clearly living in dark times. And as much as I hate it, it's probably going to get darker before it gets brighter. But God says that he's going to pour out his spirit on men and women and young and old. You and I can experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God promised. Look, I don't want to be described as one of those people who has a form of godliness but denies his power. Right, That takes us back to the beginning of the message. I'm not interested in being friends or having a relationship that's like friends with benefits with the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, God isn't going to put up with that either. We're living in the age of information. Never before in the history of the world has so much information and content been available to us. But it's time for us to move beyond information and into transformation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. May this be the cry of our hearts. May this be the cry of everyday church. May we be less concerned with wise and persuasive words and more concerned with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that lives can be changed. Marriages can be restored. Physical bodies can be healed. That people can be delivered. That addictions would be broken. That chains would fall. And that people would be set free. How? Why? Through a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want all that God has for me. We're never going to be all that he has. We're never going to be all that he has for us until we begin to receive all he has for us. I don't want to stop short. I don't want to just, you know, I've said this many times before, there's just such a disconnect between what we read in, in the New Testament and, and what we see today. And I don't understand all of that. I certainly know that, especially in the Western world, we could be a lot less selfish than we are. Is it selfishness? I don't know. You know, I don't don't know what the, I don't know what the block is that keeps it, keeps the power of God from moving like it did. Some of you that were here I've been here for a number of years. We'll remember Chris, Chris Michelson came and spoke. He's a missionary to the Middle East, really to um, Pakistan and that type of area. Um, and he does these massive crusades. You guys, does anybody remember him? I just, I don't know if you follow him on social media, but he just got back from a crusade and 150 something thousand people got saved in one night. People were being healed and 
crazy miracles are happening. I, you know, I, I don't know. Is God more God there than he is here? I mean, obviously not. I don't know what. I don't know what the disconnect is, what I'm trying to say. I don't know, and I don't know how to bridge that together. But I asked you even several weeks ago, will you just go on this journey with us as a church to pursue God with all that we are, to run after Him and the call that He has for us, even when we don't understand everything? I don't understand all the nuances of healing and why James says to call the elders of the church, and when you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And why Mark says these signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I don't understand why? Sometimes when we do that, it does, we don't see that manifestation. But I'm not going to stop doing it just because I don't see it. I'm not going to place my trust in my experiences and my, what my uh, perceived letdowns from the past. I'm going to pursue Christ. I'm going to pursue His Word. And I'm going to go back to that place of trusting that everything that He says is true, even when I don't understand it. I got a, a, just a small illustration that I wanted to show you today. And so, <clears throat> this is going back to really the emphasis today is, is, is trying to help us understand that the. Um, Brent, would you move this table to the center? You can ditch that tablecloth. Um, thank you. It's trying to understand that, that it's two separate experiences. Okay, so this is our life pre-Christ. Like, it's empty of the Spirit of God. This is who we are. And then we come to Christ, which is the first baptism, the baptism, right? We're baptized into the body of Christ, to salvation. We receive Christ. So if this is a representation of the Holy Spirit, then this is our life, and we're empty, and at salvation, then we become saved born again right so we are now see this is the holy spirit the holy spirit does live in you at salvation that's the first experience but i think what we miss a lot of times is that then jesus who is the baptizer right remember john said one's coming after me who's more powerful than me and he's he is going to baptize you into the holy spirit many of us are satisfied with this but what Jesus wants to do is then baptize us into the Holy Spirit so that we're no longer just filled. He's in us. He's around us. It's, it's a completely different experience. Salvation, the Holy Spirit is poured in to a degree. And then Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. And I just believe that God wants to do that. There are people in the room that have been filled. You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've sought God. You've, you've had that moment where you just, God's just been like, he's wrecked your life in a good way. Like you're never going back to the way it was. But Paul said to, to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. So as Christ followers, sometimes in people that are, are, are Pentecostal people or charismatic people or whatever, people that have been filled or experienced this second outpouring, this second experience with the Holy Spirit, sometimes we just, we just live our life on cruise control as if that's it. It just ha it happened. I'm done. I don't have to do this anymore. But the reality is, is that Jesus wants to baptize us again and again and again. He wants us to be full of Him and full of His Spirit so that it's not a one-time experience. It's not a, oh God, I ask you to fill me, and then He fills you, and then there's like, okay, I don't have to do anything with this. I mean, how many of you only fill your car up once after you buy it? Drive it off the lot, you get that full tank of gas from the dealership, and thank God you never have to fill it up again. Isn't that awesome? As gas prices go up, it doesn't apply to you, right? You don't have to buy more gas. Who cares if it gets to $6 a gallon? Because you filled up your car already. You're good. See, that that's, doesn't make any sense, but that's how we treat the Holy Spirit. We're like, oh, I've got him. I'm, he's, he's inside. He lives in me. I have a relationship with him. I had this moment at the altar where God did whatever, and I had this and that and all this kind of stuff, and we just live our lives on cruise control, and then we find ourselves out of gas. 
Because we didn't continue to pursue. We didn't continue to seek. We didn't continue to knock. Like it said in the book of Luke, ask and seek and knock. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit when you ask? When you ask. I asked Max to sing the song. It's just called Let It Rain. I just want to close out today and there's really no words other than let it rain. And I want to invite us to just seek the Lord for just a couple of moments before we close this out. And maybe you're in the place and you're like, I, I've experienced the Holy Spirit in a way that I can't describe, but I know that I need Him to fill me again. I need a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. My priorities have gotten out of line. I'm, I'm pursuing things that I shouldn't be pursuing, and I need to come into alignment with what He has for me. And as we sing this, I'm just going to ask that the Holy Spirit will just fill you. And there may be people sitting here that have not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit at all. You're a Christ follower, but you've never had that second experience. I'm going to ask that God would just move right where you are. You know, in the book of Acts, we see Peter preaching and the Spirit of God falling on people with nothing. We also see, we read where he, they laid hands on people and people received the Holy Spirit. We see God can do whatever He wants. But in this moment, I'm just going to ask that His Spirit just begin to move. There may be somebody in here that's like this cup. You, don't, you're, you haven't even experienced salvation. You don't even know God. Your life is empty. And God wants to meet you right where you are today. There may be somebody watching online that your, your life is completely empty. The first step in receiving all that God has for you is to surrender your life to Jesus. Let's bow our heads just On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.